verses uh, 23 to the end of, of the chapter, we're finishing, hopefully finishing up uh, 1 Thessalonians. Uh, if not tonight, we'll finish up for sure next week. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse uh, 23, we see these words from the Apostle Paul, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. The very God of peace sanctify you holy. Now the word sanctify, that's one of those salvation words, isn't it? It's one of those biblical words, those one of those church words that <clears throat> has so much meaning, and uh, in particular, and how we are to live as believers. Uh, and uh, it, it's something that non-believers, as they're you know, as they accept Christ and, and they move into this this life of growing in Christ. And as believers, it's also good to be reminded of, of what this, this sanctification is. And, and Paul makes it clear that it's the God of peace that sanctifies you. That, 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 that he is the only one that, that can make th this sanctification happen. And, and what sanctification is... Hagiazo is, it's the idea to, to be set apart, to be separate from sin to holiness. And, and even, and as someone speaking about sanctification, you know, in, in, in the realm of, of God, it's, it's the wish, the desire that each believer be sanctified. Now that God provides the sanctification. That's, that's, that's the desire that <coughs> when someone is saved, amen, they don't, they're just not left there. There is a, there is a process that begins. It, it's God's desire and God also makes it happen. It's the same thing. What's God's will for all the lost? Be to be saved. That's his will. That's his desire. What does God do to make that happen? He provides Jesus Christ and draws men to him. As, <coughs> pardon me. That's the same thing with sanctification. His desire is that once we're saved, that we are set apart Unto holiness, not to be just left there, but to be used of God. And so, therefore, to fulfill his desire, he provides the way. We find the, the noun of sanctification, we find Paul uses earlier in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, For this is the will of God. Even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. So if you're going to live a holy life, you can't be dabbling in the world, can you? You can't live the lifestyle of the world and say, oh, I'm still living this holy life that pleases God. Paul goes on and says that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any manner, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. 
For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. This life as a believer goes so much more than just, oh, I, I want to accept Christ. I want my sins forgiven. I want to know that I have an eternity in heaven. There, there is this life, this lifestyle that I, is to take, to be ingrained in us. And we ought to live a certain way. And so when Paul talks about being saved, that's what sanctified is. Is living in a way that pleases God. And God can only make that happen through the Holy Spirit in our lives. I like what C.S. Lewis wrote. He said, we are all under construction, naturally. There's unfinished lumber showing here and there. Protruding nails, an unsightly scaffolding. But it's still clear that a work is in progress that the builder has committed himself to <coughs> pardon me. The builder himself has committed himself to bring in this building into conformity with the blueprinter. That's exactly what God God has the blueprint for our lives. God has the desire for our lives. God also provides the way. For us to become what God desires. That is the process of sanctification. So when we're saved and we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, folks, that's only the beginning. And when it comes to sanctification, it doesn't matter how long we've had a relationship with Jesus Christ. We can never arrive, and we won't arrive to that place until Christ comes to get us, and we are with Christ in eternity. Peter writes in, in 2 Peter chapter 1 with concerning this thought, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having ex escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Really another phrase or for, for this world's lifestyle, the way this world conducts themselves, the way this world acts. And we were just talking before, Church a little bit to Bible study tonight. The way a believer is to live versus the way America is going is night and day. Amen. It is night and day. And the reason is that is that believers are to live their lives according to what brings God honor and glory and in living an obedient life. <clears throat> and for that to happen, the Spirit must be allowed to work in our lives to lead us in that direction. And that is this sanctification process that that Paul writes about, that, that Peter writes about, Peter goes on to say that as we escape corruption, he says in verse 5 of chapter 1, 2 Peter, besides this, giving all diligence, all of our attention, you know, if our attention would be placed in, in the right direction, a lot of the problems that we have, the issues that we have, would disappear. But look what he says. Give to all diligence. He's talking to believers here. Add to your faith. What is our faith? It's what we have put in Jesus Christ, the finished work of Jesus Christ. It's by faith that we're saved. The grace from God and the faith that we put in the work of Christ. <coughs> that we're saying. He says, add to your faith. 
Not add so that you might be saved. You're saved, but add to that salvation virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you, and abound, it's more than just saying, oh, I got these things in me. But then, if these things are abound, we're not selfish, they, they abound, they make you that you should never, neither be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you see two things here about sanctification that, that Peter's talking about. One we've, we've already mentioned, until we're with, we'll never arrive. There's always something that in our life. But how about this? Do we ever get to a point where we gain so much knowledge that we completely know everything about God? Now we laugh, he's only laughing at that. And if we're honest, we'll probably say we know less about God now than when we first were saved. I mean, there are times, there may be times in our lives where we thought, you know what? Man, I've read God's word. I got, I mean, man, I'm getting this stuff. I'm figuring this stuff out. But then the more we <coughs> the more that we seek. The Lord in this journey, the more we find out, the less that we really know. But then the more we want to know. And so we, this, this describes this process that Paul is telling the Thessalonians. The very God of peace sanctify you holy, not part of you, not pieces of you, not half of you, but holy. And he says, I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless. So I want us to look at three aspects that we find in Scripture concerning this thought of sanctification. That, I mean, in, in, in Scripture plainly dis, uh, uh, informs us instru and instructs us on the, and the importance of these aspects. And the first one is this, the positional sanctification of the believer. There, there's a positional sanctification. You see, at salvation, God has secured a positional sanctification through the death of Jesus Christ. Once we're saved, we're what? Always. We're always saved. There is a position that can never be lost. Now, how does that help us in our daily life? <laughs> There's assurance because how many times does Satan try to throw doubt in our lives? Oh, we're not good enough, or you know, I wonder this, or I wonder that. We find the writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter ten, starting in verse ten, says, "By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, and every priest standeth daily ministering and offering, oftentimes the same sacrifice, which can never take away the sins." What's the writer saying? Well, remember the sacrifices that would take place on the altar at the temple? Every year they'd have to bring in their, 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 their sacrifice. And <coughs> every year the priests would do what? They would take that sacrifice, they'd put it on the altar, they would sacrifice it, uh, setting up offerings to the Lord, once a year, the the priest would the high priest would go into the holy of ho holiest of holies on behalf of the people. But guess what? That never took, did it? I mean, you can imagine we 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 get this idea that the temple is this magnificent looking ornate thing, but 
man, where the, where the altar was. I mean, it was just constantly, you were reminded of blood. I mean, not only the look, but after a while, what's the smell? I mean, the temple was the holy place, and it stunk. What would happen if, I mean, we, we look at the church building as a holy place. What would happen if we'd come into worship and it stunk? Right then, our worship is turned off. But how different was it? They bring their sound. I mean, and it did. Now, you know, it'd be open air, but still. Blood is blood. And blood that sits and blood that, you know, blood that is burned and flesh that is burned, there is a stench. But that's where they were coming. And they did it over and over because it didn't take. But the writer says in verse 10, once and for all. Through the body of Jesus Christ, we are sanctified. And in verse 12, but this man, if he had offered one sacrifice for sin, forever sat down on the right hand of the hand of God, for henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. There is this positional sanctification in Christ because of what he has done on the cross once and for all that's why some title of the book of Hebrews better Christ is better than anything that those that want to go back to the law or anything we can even comprehend once and for all we have this position in that God has rescued Believers in this positional sanctification. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, Therefore, if any man what? Be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Why is it that we have a, such a hard time of letting go of the past And grabbing hold of the future, even though God has said we are a new creation, creature created through Christ Jesus. Why is it? What is it in the past that we hold on to so what is what is the draw to the past? And we, we battle with that. Things that are in the past. Christ has come in. He, he has made us a new creation. We have this new position. We have been set aside because of the work of Christ, but we want to hold on to the past. Paul says, though the past has been done away with, it's been passed, the old things have passed away, all new things have become new, and all things are of God who hath reconciled. To himself by here we go through or by Christ Jesus and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation old is passed away he has made us new he has reconciled us but look what Paul says in verse 20 because of this process. Now then, he says, wait. He doesn't say, I, hey, I got it all. I, I'm Paul. I've got this calling from God. You know, I, I am an apostle. Not once do we ever see Paul with that tone, do we? What pronoun does he use? Now we. Who's he writing to? The church of Corinth here. What do we know about the church of Corinth? Now this is in 2 Corinthians. We know a whole lot about Corinth in the 1 Corinthians. That was a church that's filled with a lot of issues. 
I mean, you talk about a church that needed some church discipline going on. But Paul says, now then we are what? Even those that dealt with, and Paul was, was teaching them and admonishing them to change. He says, we've been reconciled. We've been set apart. We've been rescued. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. One that heralds, one that a, a representative. I mean, America has re ambassadors to different co uh, to countries, don't they? And what's the purpose of that ambassador? Represent. To represent. Paul says we are ambassadors with Christ, as through God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead that be, be ye. Reconcile to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Going from sin, being reconciled, going from worldliness, sinfulness, to righteousness, that is the process of being saved. Now that God declared one who puts their faith in Christ declares them righteous. What does Paul write? I and mean, we find it in Romans chapter 1 and verse 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 2. How does Paul open those books? To the what of what? To the saints. To the saints of right, to the saints at court, to the We are saints because God has declared us saints. We are saints because God has made us right. He has reconciled us. Sainthood isn't declared by the Pope. Sainthood is not a Catholicism thing. Sainthood, te Catholicism teaches sainthood is this, and you have to wait five years unless the Pope decides to change it. You know, hence, when Mother Teresa passes away, instead of waiting the five years, kind of like, you know, it's kind of like, you, you almost think the Pope has gotten with the NFL, you know, football and basketball and baseball Hall of Fames, you know, because... You can't go into the Hall of Fame unless you, what, been retired five years? You can't, in Catholicism, you cannot be a saint or be considered a saint unless you've been dead for five years. Or unless the Pope decides to change because of circumstances. They did that with Mother Teresa. The Hall of Fame can change under certain circumstances. Roberto Clemente passes away. He did not have to wait the five years. Kobe Bryant passes away in, in the helicopter. Car. He did not have to wait the five years. What happens the following year there enshrined in the Hall of Fame? So with Catholicism, wait five years. There, there is a step where you have to be you have to be a servant of God. You have to show <coughs> You have to show proof of a life of heroic virtue. You have to have verified miracles. There's three miracles you have to have verified for you to be a saint. Then you have to be canonized. You have to be voted on. That's not God. What do we find in Scripture? Through Christ's blood... God has reconciled himself to us. He has made us as if we are right. That's what being justified is, isn't it? And he, the process of setting us aside for a holy work. And in doing so, he calls us saints. That's the positional sanctification that we have. But there's another one that I want us to see is this, is there's the ultimate sanctification of the believer. God makes the believer sinless in body and life in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 7 and 
chapter 3 and verse 24, our conversation is in heaven. From hence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. I cannot wait till this vile body is done away with. I am so, I am so ready to get past this week. This, has, I'll be honest, this has just really taken me out of my, my norm. Sunday I felt out of place. I mean, and I just, I mean, and it reminded me just how earth and this, our bodies are. But then as he said, I cannot wait for that day when this, this vile body no more hacking, no more coughing, no more drainage. You know, no more aches, pains, all of those things. But better that, the day where I mean we are in Christ no more sin that's the ultimate. When we, we talk about arriving, when we are with Christ, this old vile body is done away with. He has subdued all things unto himself. We get this picture, this ultimate sanctification. John writes in Revelation chapter 19, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready, and to the and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. This final uh, realize, realization of the Lord's New Testament church being presented as a bride before <laughs> Christ. Holy and spotless. We have this positional, but then we have the ultimate looking forward to. That's why we can say this world's not my home. I'm just passing through. That's why when we can see the wickedness of, say, America, we can still have hope that, you know what, I yes, I'm in it, but I'm not of it. My eyes are on the finisher, the author, and the finisher of my faith. I mean, John, and in John chapter 21, and I saw the holy, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God, God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things. I love that word all. Not just some, but I make all things new. And he said unto me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son, but be the fearful one. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's. Oh my goodness, what we have in store for those that have put their faith and trust in Christ. 
We have a position that we can never lose, but we have a finality of when we get with Christ, when we are with Christ, when we see him, when we finally get to see him as he is, a new body that's not vile, that's not broken, that is perfect, that is pure, that is holy. And so we get, we, as a believer, we have that to look forward to. Paul's writing to the Thessalonians with everything that they're dealing with. Remember at the beginning of the book what they're facing. The God of peace sanctifies you. You have something to look forward to. But here's what I, one last thing I want us to see is this. <coughs> Not only just the position and the ultimate, but the present sanctification of the believer. Here's this third part. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, but we all, here he, he, he's including all of us again, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. What's he talking about? What happens when you stand before a glass? You see yourself. You stand there long enough, what's going to happen? You'll see yourself change. I mean, you go one day, oh yeah, boy, that I did, boy, that, boy, that's a nice, clean smooth shave. I go the next day and I look in the same mirror and I'm like, what in the world happened? What took place? A change took place. And, and we can see that. Paul says, listen, beholding as a glass, as we look in, what the glory of God does, it changes us into the image, the same image from glory to glory as, as by the Spirit of the Lord. There is a process that's going on in our, even as we speak. God is moving us and making us and molding us what? into the image of His Son. That's what C.S. Lewis was talking about. There is a work still be, to be done. Now, I've mentioned this before, the Hemphills used to say, I think they're the ones that made it famous, Quartet, he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be? And as God moves us, it's in pursuit of holiness. So if we're going to say, oh, the Holy Spirit is leading me to do this, and if you, and it's truly connected with God, listen, if it's not leading you to be holy, God's not in it. If it's not leading you to become more like Christ, God's not in it. I, I've heard enough, uh, enough people say, oh, the Holy Spirit is leading me from a church. Well, one, I never see where, and you don't see in Scripture where the Holy Spirit leads you from another church. You don't go against principles of God and expect God to bless. In your personal life, oh, I just feel the Spirit. Listen, if it doesn't connect with God and it's not moving you to become more like Christ, looking like Christ, it's not of Christ. And that's not part of the sanctification. And that's something that as we as believers must let go. God will never go against his principles. God never promises that everything's going to be perfect. God doesn't promise comfort. But he does promise to always be there with us. And he does promise that he's molding us and making us into the image of his son. Look where he says, Paul, or pardon me, Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 14 says, As obedient children, not fashioning ourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, 
But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Well, I can't be holy. Well, we can't, but who has called you? Can any of us be holy? No. But if you're saved, you have been called by God. And if you have been called by God, he is holy. Therefore, we ought to live our lives in what? Such a way that we strive for that holiness. But he, be holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. God is the source. God is the source of all this sanctification. There is a Puritan, Thomas Watson said this, Sanctification is a principle of grace savingly wrought, whereby the heart becomes holy and is made after God's own heart. A sanctified person bears not only God's name, but his image. I think we, one of the pro biggest problems we have is that we have, we've allowed this sanctification and how we look at sanctification to drive us in everything. Not only are we to have the name of God as a believer, but we are, what does he say? We are to have his image. So when people see us, what ought they ought to see? God. His attributes living in and through us. But you know what has happened? We've messed up that idea. We just claim the name Christian, and we go live whatever way. We claim the name church member. But listen, a church member is more than just a name on a roll. There is a significance. There is an honor to be a church member. There is a privilege to be a church member. There are expectations to being a church member. We don't just turn them off. But guess what? That's the problem. We see, we do it with sanctification. We think we can turn it off when we feel like it. Oh, I'll be sanctified on Sundays. I'll be sanctified when anybody sees me. And then turn off when I want and I can go act and say whatever I want. It doesn't work that way. But when we do it that way, guess what? Oh, it's all easier. You know, I'll put the label on as a church member when it benefits me. And I'll turn it off when, you know, I want to go do something else. It doesn't work. We are believers 24-7. Amen? Amen? Christian, Christ followers 24-7. If we are believers, guess what? We are to be sanctified. And that process is 24-7. If we allow ourselves to be led by the Spirit through the process of sanctification, guess what? The whole church member thing, the whole serving thing, everything that, guess what? Those things fall into place where they ought to be. I read this story. There's a couple who like to go to England, and there's this particular store that they like to uh, to go to, and on the 25th anniversary, they went to this store, and they, they liked the antiques and pottery, but their favorite thing was teacups. Teacups. And they went in the store, and there's this one particular teacup, and they said, can we, can we see this teacup? We've never seen one so, not, so beautiful. And as the lady handed it to him, the key, the, what made this special, the, the teacup spoke up. No joke. And the teacup said, you don't understand. I have not always been a teacup. There was a time when I was red clay. My master took me and, and rolled me and patted me over and over, and I yelled out, let me alone. But he only smiled and said, not yet. 
that I was placed on this spinning wheel. And suddenly I was spun around and around and around. And, and I yelled, stop it. I, I'm getting dizzy. And I screamed at him. But the master only nodded and said, not yet. Then he put me in an oven. And I, I never felt such heat. And I yelled, and I, and I knocked at the door, and I could see him through the opening, and I could read his lips as he shook his head, and he said, not yet. Finally, the door opened, and he put me on the shelf, and I, he's like, whew, I began to cool. And he brushed me, and he painted me all over, and, and those fumes were horrible. And I thought to myself, I, I'm going to gag. And he said, stop it. And I said, stop it and stop it, I cried. And he only nodded. Not yet. And then the crazy guy suddenly put it back in the oven. But it wasn't like the first one. This one was twice as hot, and I knew I would suffocate. And I begged, and I pleaded, and I screamed, and I cried. And I would never make it. I was ready to give up. But the door opened, and he took me out. And he placed me on the shelf. And an hour later, he handed me a mirror and said, look at yourself. And Thinkum said, I did. And Thinkum said, that's not me. That couldn't be me. I'm beautiful. I'm, I'm beautiful. I want you to remember then, he said, I know it hurts to be rolled and patted but if I had just had left you alone, you would have dried up. I know it made you dizzy to spin all around on that wheel, but if I had stopped, you would have crumbled. I know it hurts, and it was hot and disagreeable in the oven, but if I hadn't put you in there, you would have cracked. I know the fumes were bad when I brushed you and painted you all over, but if I hadn't have done that, you never would have hardened. You would never have had any color in your life. I know the second oven was hotter than the first, but if I hadn't put you in there, you wouldn't have survived for long because the hardness would not have held. Now you're a finished product. You are what I had in mind when I first began with you. Folks, God knows what he's doing. God knows what he's doing. He's the potter. We're the clay. He'll mold us and make us. We may think it's not working. But when he's done, we'll be a flawless piece of work to fulfill his good, pleasing, perfect will. That's that's what God wants to do in and through our lives through the Holy Spirit. The question is, are we in a place to even allow the Spirit to move in our lives? Are we in a place where you know, we're looking in the wrong places? We're looking at the wrong people. Instead of maybe we just need to be looking God Sanctify me. What does the uh, the psalmist say? Search me, Lord. Search what? Search my heart. Not search my men's heart, my family's heart, my spouse's heart. No, search me. God, work in me. Sanctify me. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you. We thank you for the. Lord, the many blessings that you give us. And Lord, we thank you for the truth of your word. Lord, this process of sanctifying, Lord, we thank you that you save us, but then you also, Lord, you set aside us to be used of you. You, you see in us what we can't see. And Lord, I ask that you just continue to be allowed to mold, to make us into the image of Christ. Because Lord, when we as individuals allow you to, 
to mold and to make us. And Lord, then you mold and make us into the church that you would want us to be. That can be used of you. That portrays your glory and what you see. And Lord, when they see us, they don't see our glory, but they, Lord, you draw people to you, the maker, the author, the potter. Lord, I thank you that this is your desire, but not only that, Lord, I thank you that you provide the means through Jesus Christ. And Lord, help us to remain in a place to continue to be molded of you and at the same time may we keep our eyes on Jesus who's the author and the finisher be with us as we go from this place keep us safe so that we can come back again together Lord in a united way worshiping you on Sunday and it's in Christ's name that we pray Amen, Amen.